Welcome back to this episode of Curbside Consults. I'm Mirdula. I'm one of the New England Journal of Medicine editorial fellows. Today I have with me two doctors who are also astronauts, or perhaps they're astronauts who are also doctors. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my first guest, Dr. Serena Anand Chancellor, to introduce herself, and then Dr. Mike Barrett will introduce himself as well. Well, hey, good morning. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. As you said, my name is Serena Anand Chancellor. I flew to the International Space Station in 2018 on Expedition 56 and 57 and spent just shy of 200 days, 197, and I count every day, on board ISS. It was an amazing experience. Uh, I am board certified in both internal medicine and aerospace medicine, and currently I'm an associate professor of clinical medicine at LSU here in Baton Rouge, where I teach internal medicine residents and medical students. I'm also the current program director for the UTMB Aerospace Medicine Residency in Galveston, Texas, and I still work for the Astronaut Corps. So I have many hats, many roles, just depends on the day of the week, but happy to be here. Good morning, uh, Mridula, and so much for having me as well. I, uh, like Dr. Anna Chancellor, Serena, my very close friend, am uh, double boarded in aerospace medicine and internal medicine before that. It actually makes a, a great combination. And I have been at the Johnson Space Center since uh, 1991. And I've worn a lot of hats because there's just a lot of niches being built and, and available in this world uh, we live in. I work as a NASA flight surgeon for nine years. And then I transitioned over to the astronaut office in the year 2000. I have been lucky to fly twice since we're counting days, 199 days in uh, 2009 on the International Space Station, and then another uh, 13 days on the final mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery in 2011, so 212 or so, so far. In what I think is a great effort for NASA at recycling old but reliable spaceflight hardware, I'll be going back to the space station in early 2024. And throughout that time, and, and I believe the same is true for Serena, I've had very close ties with space medicine, both from the research and the academic worlds. I do teach in various programs and have an adjunct faculty appointment at the University of Exeter in the UK in their extreme medicine master's program. And so it's a very good combination of practice, being able to experience the environment firsthand, teaching, and always kind of pushing the field forward because it is very new. Well, I think maybe I'd better start off by asking a basic question, which is, what is aerospace medicine really? So what is aerospace medicine? It's broad, but it's small. It's broad because it covers different environments, which in general include civil aviation and high performance flight that the military performs. Think about fighter jets and whatnot. And of course, space. And so it covers three areas that might seem a bit divided. However, they are unified in many of the factors that really define the environment that the person is in who we take care of. And that includes different acceleration forces, everything from zero G to high G, different pressures, everything from sea level to basically vacuum where we have to protect people in spacesuits, and different atmospheric compositions where we have to vary the concentration of oxygen and diluent gas. And then we transition between habitats and the outside. And so it, it is a very unified field of aerospace medicine. It has a lot of common factors that when you actually practically apply it, uh, goes into very different niches. And of course, both of us are more into the space medicine aspect of it. But how I got into it, I was a pilot. I was very interested in marine sciences. My undergrad degree is marine zoology. I liked photography. And when you really look at a place, try to find a place that puts all those things together. Well, the space program does that. And in particular, if you really love biology and human physiology, which I do, and just the extreme environments in which we can operate, there's really only one thing that ties that all together, and that's aerospace medicine. So for me, it was a growing awareness as I entered medical school and did my internal medicine residency. And I will say that I did internal medicine very deliberately as a career path stepping stone, because as I looked in the mid to late 80s, I know that sounds like ancient history for many people on here, there seemed to be a divide, if you will, between the science that was being done on the human in space and the actual medical support that was done by the medical operations people. And I really wanted to bridge that gap. So I wanted to learn physiology and pathophysiology really well. And so I did my internal medicine residency at Northwestern in Chicago, and uh, they humored me for most of my residency. And then I spent an extra year as chief resident there in the internal medicine program, which was one of the greatest years of my life, I do have to say. 
But then I went to do the aerospace medicine residency at Wright State University. And looking back on it, that combination has really served me very well. There are actually several people who are dual boarded in internal and aerospace medicine at the NASA Johnson Space Center, both in the astronaut office and in the flight surgeon corps. And so the combination is very good. I think most of us really feel that our dreams have really come true with that preparation and the way that we're able to apply it and observe and to kind of uh, help push this field forward. So I guess that's kind of the holistic big picture of how I got into it. Yeah, in Merdula, if I don't, if you don't mind, if I don't add something in. Please. I agree. So I love internal medicine, but that's what I would have done had I never been involved with aerospace. And that's often what we tell people coming into this field. I, I love being a detective. That being said, a good portion of our residents are many different specialties, emergency medicine, family medicine. My program director, which I still consider one of the premier leaders in this field, was Dr. Richard Jennings, and he's an OBGYN. And so it's just a fantastic combination for a lot of different specialties. And so when I have students, especially applying for residency, come up and say, hey, what specialty should I go into? What does NASA want? I tell them that's the wrong question to ask. I say, what do you want to do? You want to be an ENT physician. Would you like to go into radiology? And we encourage them to do that because NASA needs all sorts of physicians to go into this field, even more so today than say 10 or 20 years ago, especially with the advent of commercial space and the number of people we're flying. We are flying sicker people today than we have ever flown in the past. Space flight is definitely one important aspect of your day-to-day -day career, but I'm sure that there's more to being an aerospace physician that goes on behind the scenes. What does your day-to-day -day really look like? Dr. Anand Chancellor, you mentioned rounding the hospital. And before we got started, we were talking a little bit about some of your teaching activities, Dr. Barrett. But what is a day in the life of an aerospace physician really look like? Yes, yeah, so I think it's important, Merdula, to make the distinction between what Dr. Barrett and I did when we joined the astronaut corps. That's almost completely separate from our lives as aerospace medicine specialists. So I think a lot of people believe when you train in aerospace medicine that you will fly to space. And for the majority of folks, that's not true. It's not a program that trains you to fly. So Dr. Barrett mentioned he was a flight surgeon for a very long period of time. We trained in an aerospace medicine residency to do that. I did the same thing. We had to throw our hats in the ring with every other warm-blooded American who wanted to be an astronaut and get into the core. Once you get into the core, you find yourself surrounded by people with a variety of backgrounds, chemists, engineers, military test pilots, flight test engineers. It's just really an amazing group. And they take your class and they train you very similarly across the board so that you can all perform spacewalks or run the robot arm, maintenance onboard ISS procedures. And then that way, once you all get up to ISS and you're working together as a crew, you're all equally able to do those tasks. Now, if there were a medical emergency in space or some sort of condition that popped up, if you happen to have a physician on the crew, because it is not required, that person most likely would obviously step on as the crew medical officer. We actually have two crew medical officers assigned to a flight. Many of those times, that crew medical officer um, is not a physician. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there first, because when you say, what's the life of an aerospace medicine physician like? What I hearken back to is what is it like to be a flight surgeon working for the space agency? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that brings up an important point of talking about space medicine, aerospace medicine residency, is giving uh, residents who might be interested in pursuing further training an idea of what range of options are open to them. It's not just space flight. It sounds like there's quite a bit more that goes into that. Yeah. So when you train in aerospace medicine, specialists. So they go through the residency. The majority of our folks are hired by our largest employer, and that is NASA. And they are flight surgeons who look after astronauts and their families years before that particular astronaut flies in flight and of course post-flight, as well as a host of different tasking from how do we build medical kits for Mars? How do we look at a lunar base? When you get hired as a flight surgeon, though, you are not assigned to fly. Okay, so the majority of your aerospace medicine specialists are trained to do just that, provide aerospace medicine expertise for a government agency like NASA, or more so nowadays, a commercial space entity like SpaceX or Axiom. 
or Virgin Galactic. In fact, a lot of our graduates from UTMB have gone on to be chief medical officers for many of these companies. And so, again, if you'd like to fly, what I will say is in the next five to 10 years, will some of these companies want to have physicians flying with them, even on some of these shorter missions? Yes, most likely so. We haven't seen that yet. But so the way we train our folks is to make sure that they get a broad-based experience in everything from behavioral medicine of the space flyer, a lot of physiology, as Dr. Barrett mentioned, it's tremendously heavy on education and space flight physiology. We train them to operate in extreme environments. We train them about medical certification because more so nowadays, we've got folks like Captain Kirk who want to fly. So how do you certify somebody like that for flight? I'm very broadly touching some of the areas. There's so many areas we train our folks in. But when you look at it at its core, this is long-term care of the flyer. So an aerospace medicine specialist doesn't just take care of somebody during the mission. Let's say it's a 12-day mission. It is a year or two leading up to flight during the mission itself and, of course, post-flight, which requires a lot of different areas of expertise. Yeah, let me add a couple of things to that as well. I absolutely agree. There's a couple of things that I want to be sure people understand. Space medicine in particular, which we do, is part of aerospace medicine. Again, so many of the skills are transferable. But even with that, even with the new commercial entities rising, it's still a niche field. It's not ever going to be really big, and it's not ever going to pay very well. When I go to my medical school reunions and I talk to my classmates, they're enthralled at what I do. And then they ask, how much money do you make? And then they just drop it like a hot potato. Typically about half of what those who graduated with me in internal medicine is what I've made throughout my career. And that's with double boarding and, and I think fairly strong commitment to it. So let the buyer beware as they kind of approach this field. Having said that, being a NASA flight surgeon is, I will say, the second best job in the world. It is really amazing for all the reasons Serena mentioned. You are part of something really big and really amazing, and you become a subject matter expert that enables this whole effort of space flight exploration, moving civilization forward and potentially off the planet. And so it is all of that, developing kids, doing medical research, nurturing crew members and their families. You're among the last to see a crew when they launch and among the first to see them when they land. And you see all of this in action. You work as a flight controller and mission control as part of an amazing team. And you advise the program on what we would call the most critical system in this whole effort, which is the human. And so never want to sell that short. It's a grind and there's a lot to know. And just like any other place in medicine, you could never know enough. But as people explore the field, anybody who's listening, who's interested, bear those things in mind and then come forward. We will need new people. There's no question about it. That's a fascinating point you bring up, Dr. Anand Chancellor, about space travel and space tourism. Can you tell me a little bit more about who goes into space? There has been a lot more sort of casual space travel, if you can call it that. Yeah, that's a great question because it is so predominantly in the news today. Everybody has seen that Captain Kirk recently flew at the age of 90. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the traditional astronaut that flew into space was a professional NASA astronaut or from one of our international partner agencies. We spend years really in training before launching into space. And we nowadays, the normal duration of a mission is anywhere from six months to a year. So it's a very long period of time with a lot of tasks that need to be accomplished. Of course, with commercial space flight, you, know, you have Blue Origin, you have SpaceX, you have Virgin Galactic, all of whom have launched paying customers or folks who happen to kind of win the golden ticket and get a ride. And so now we're faced with a group of people who maybe in the past would never have been medically certified to fly as a NASA astronaut. For example, they've had a past history of cancer or they have current coronary artery disease or atrial fibrillation. I mean, any number of medical conditions where maybe they're actively being treated, they're stable, obviously. So when you ask about medical certification, that's probably at the crux of a lot of discussions nowadays, and it's still actively being decided with the FAA and several commercial spaceflight entities. The neat thing about this is we are now gathering data on folks with comorbidities that I mentioned previously that we've never had before. NASA ourselves, we have flown several people with medical conditions. We haven't been terribly public about that, nor have we published it really to protect the privacy of the crew member, and we will always do that. However, we've actually gathered enough data in certain fields where we're going to start presenting this sort of medical data to the research community, to the operational community, 
of course, always protecting privacy, but to say, hey, no kidding, we've had five cases of NASA astronauts with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter or some sort of other atrial arrhythmia. And it's time that the community sees that because this is really going to become predominant with commercial space. So I think the hard part is going to be wrestling all that data and putting it into a central database for, for everybody to see. But yeah, this is now the new era of the commercial spaceflight traveler, whether it's a very short 30 minute mission to maybe 12 days around the moon. So I can't wait to see what that brings. Let me add a couple things. We play a very long game, if you will. We look at a big picture of which we see only a small part of it. And part of NASA's charter, aside from exploring and really pushing the boundaries, is to try to open up the space frontier, not to keep it as an arena that can only be entered by a bunch of elite folks who are in great shape and have high IQs. And, you know, I can tell you that I'm neither of those. So there are some limits and caveats, certainly, but we are having that experience right now. And it pays us forward in many different ways. It shares an experience that is just an incredible one that, that really changes your outlook on your place in the world and off the world. But it also sends a powerful message that this is really for everyone. It's not for a small group of elites by any stretch of imagination. And it is part of this bigger picture where at some point, some fraction or percentage of us will leave the earth and start living permanently outside as we colonize the solar system and potentially further. So we really have to think about that big picture and this is just one step along the way. Well, that brings up an interesting question about sort of the kind of medical monitoring that might be required for people who, healthy or otherwise, are experiencing physiologic changes in space. We know that the loss of gravity certainly has its effect on the human body. And I'm curious to hear more about how the human changes after time spent in space. One thing about it is that you have to understand that you're not dealing with a normal human body as you're trying to make those diagnostic decisions. When you go into weightlessness, pretty much every system in your body starts changing as soon as the engine's cut off and your rocket ride into orbit is done. And a lot of people think about zero gravity as a stressor on the human body, but in reality, it's a removal of all the stresses that the human body is normally challenged with on a daily basis that we have to work against. So that gravity, for instance, pulling your hydrostatic blood column downwards all the time, and you need sophisticated mechanisms to maintain blood pressure to your brain when you go from a lying to a standing position or when you're tolerating greater loads, such as higher G-forces. And the same is true with your bones and muscles. They're constantly being stressed and built and rebuilt and resorbed. And it's just this wonderful equation of homeostasis that you can perturb by loading higher. You work out, you get bone, you get muscle. You take that away, well, you lose bone, you lose muscle, and your body doesn't really like that extra vascular capacity that you needed down on Earth. And so it sheds maybe 15% of your circulating plasma volume and about 12 to 15 percent of your red blood cell mass. And there are similar changes in autonomic control, in the neurovestibular control. Your sense of balance basically is radically altered. So all of these things happen and change so that after you've been up there for maybe two weeks for most of the main changes, maybe six weeks for the deep neurovestibular changes, you're basically dealing with an extraterrestrial with a, a very different set of physiologic norms. So we gather a tremendous amount of data on folks who fly, certainly on long six-month missions to the ISS. We are gathering human data all the time from saliva to blood to urine collections, 24-hour urine collections to feces to surveys looking at behavioral health. So we've collected a tremendous amount. We have special freezers on board the ISS where we store them and then eventually brought back down to the ground later on and analyzed. I think your factors are the same as it would be here on Earth. Genetic tendencies, if you happen to have a very strong family history, male versus female, certain medications you may be on or some protective, others not so protective. I would love to see us perform more of those diagnostics real time on board ISS. For example, bone density. Is there any way we can perform things real time to get a sense? Every crew member is different when it comes to loss of bone mineral density on orbit. And you may want to know in the middle of a one-year mission, how much bone density loss is occurring here? Do we need to make a change in, say, an exercise prescription or perhaps even initiate a medication? And that's where I feel that the technology has to drive us. And when I say technology, this can't be a piece of equipment or hardware that's huge. This has to be small, almost pocket-sized if possible. 
We have a lot of groups looking at that, but that's where I hope we get to because at some point we've got to begin making more clinical decisions on orbit. And we're very good with things like ultrasound. We perform ultrasound all the time and it's remote guided ultrasound and we have real-time answers. But for other samples, other human samples, I'd love to see us gather more data real time so we can drive that clinical decision-making. So Merdula, I'm going to ask Mike this question only because I've never had the chance to ask him, but this is something I experienced on orbit. We talk about all the different systems that are undergoing changes and, and sort of what I call reprogramming. And so if you think about body position sense on earth, right, you have your visual cues, you have proprioception, right, boots on the ground, and you have your inner ear balance. You know, it can tell you if you're pitching forward, tilting to the side. Well, up there in space, you really kind of knock out two of those three. There's proprioception, but you're floating in the middle of nowhere. So there's not one part of your body that can tell you if you're pushed down against the floor or you're touching a wall. I mean, you know where you are, certainly during daytime. But what would happen to me at night, I would wake up in the middle of the night and think I was completely inverted in my crew quarters, in my sleeping quarters. And it took a good 15 to 20 seconds for the only system I believed I had left, which was my visual cues, for my eyes to say, is there anything I can focus on in my crew quarters in the dark? Those being the lights on my laptop that would reorient me to tell me that, no kidding, Serena, you're actually upright. You're not flipped upside down. That would happen about once every two weeks. A little disconcerting, but then I got used to it. So I have to ask Dr. Barrett if he experienced the same thing. It's a great question. I experienced that immediately when the engines cut off. I had an immediate sensation when we enter weightlessness that I was inverted, that I was hanging upside down on the monkey bars. And that goes with that fluid shift, the uh, capacitance vasculature in your lower extremities just basically moves up to your chest and head. And it feels like you're hanging upside down. And some of that gets better after your plasma volume diminishes a little bit. And so after a week or 10 days or so, that helps. But you still have this tonic pressure, if you will, on your baroceptors and some of the other receptors basically above the heart that just never goes away. And you're absolutely right. All of our neurovestibular investigations show a drastic shift towards dependence on vision for orientation. And so if you deprive yourself of vision, and the same is true when you come back to earth, we, we see that a lot. If you deprive yourself of that vision, you have sort of this G-state flashback that you're feeling like you're not in space, you're back on Earth, but wait a minute, I'm feeling this tonic pressure on some of my baroceptors and proprioceptors in my, above the heart, and I must be inverted. So I've heard that story, although you might have had it a little bit longer than some, but anytime you have somebody who's a little disoriented when they're adapting to weightlessness or when they're adapting to 1G again, turn on the lights <laughs> and we established that strong visual. We've actually had stories of people who even a week and a half after landing from a six month mission would wake up in the middle of the night and perhaps they have to run to the bathroom, but they're not sure where they are because it's dark and they feel pressure on them, but they think that's the straps holding them in their sleeping bag against the wall. And they'll try to fly to the bathroom and clunk to the floor. And so we tell the spouses, be sure you turn on the light if they wake up at night. So what you describe is your version on the probability distribution of, I think, how those senses are interpreted, but it really highlights the really strong visual dependence that we have and really how we deeply adapt up there. I love this stuff. I think you both have brought up some really interesting points about changes in physiology, as well as sort of adapting to the space environment and then re-entry, if you will. I'm curious to hear how much of the change that's experienced in space is permanent. I mean, maybe from your own experiences or from the literature, once you go to space and you come back, are you still the same person that you were when you left? Not according to my kids. <laughs> are you talking system-wise physiology versus behaviorally versus just as a human being? I guess all of those things. Oh, that's a complicated question. I'll start because I'm sure Mike is going to have a longer answer than me. But for me, as a person, I didn't come back with any physiologic changes, for example, bone loss that did not eventually return to normal. But for me, as a person, as a human, as a physician, space does put a new perspective on things. I really believe it gives you more appreciation for this planet. And a lot of people talk about the overview effect when they see Earth from space for the first time. I did not have that. What I mean when I say that is I realized after being up there for 197 days, I had these 
magnificent views of Earth, views that are really hard to describe to someone unless, even with a video, it's hard to describe. What I missed was feeling Earth. It was smelling the rain, smelling the grass, feeling the wind on your face, cold winter day. Those are things you just can't mimic up there. And so when I returned home, I found that I had a much deeper appreciation for experiencing Earth. And I began to get a little bit of that before I left the planet as well. As a physician, it changed me in the sense that I feel like I spend more time with my patients. I appreciate each patient more as a person. I agree with Serena. You definitely come down with a totally different appreciation of, of your home planet when you're not on it for a long period of time. You can't not appreciate your home planet and the people who live on it much more after a spaceflight experience. You're up there and there's typically five other people up there. The only humans who are not on the planet are you guys. And you're just in an incredibly privileged position with an incredibly rare and privileged perspective. Again, something we'd really love to share with everyone. You find out that you probably need less than you thought to get by from one day to another as far as food, consumables, hygiene, water, you know, all these different things. And you really kind of bond with your crewmates in a way that you just wish the rest of the world could do. So I'll leave that at that. There are some physiologic changes that do happen to folks that for some become permanent. One of the things we mentioned bone density and bone loss, and it, it does appear that the bone that we maintain on board, either by some of the heavy resistive exercise we do or some of the medications like bisphosphonates that we take might actually protect us from losing absolute density, but might actually lay down bone of a different architecture. And whether that is the same bone, the same strength, and with the same protective qualities against fractures is still an open question. And for me, I experienced a neuroophthalmic syndrome, which now affects, we recognize, about 70% of people who fly long duration. And there is a constellation of findings that go with that, including increased total retinal thickness and uh, globe flattening, hyperopic shift, increased ophthalmic sheath diameter. I had a bunch of those, and including optic disc edema, which did resolve, but a lot of those other changes persisted. So years after that space flight, my neuroophthalmic tract is permanently remodeled. And if you were to give me a 3T MRI and let me MRI America, I could probably tell you with some degree of certainty who flew in space long duration, because some of these effects are very subtle, but are somewhat persistent. And these are some of the things that we know and recognize. There are certainly others which we have yet to know and recognize. So yeah, so there may be some changes that, that are long lasting. And in the acute phase, if you give me, say, a month after space flight, you want me to figure out who in the room just landed recently, you know, turn out the lights and do a Romberg, you'll find out real quick. <laughs> so, because they're still trying to get their balance back. So there are some changes and whether those are penalties you pay or just physiologic markers of space flight or anatomic markers of space flight, those are open questions. And we do know that astronauts tend to live longer than the general population and remain functional which is great, but it doesn't mean that some of those aren't detrimental. Another thing is we do soak up a lot of ionizing radiation up there, quite a bit. And so uh, you carry that with you in the form of an excess cancer risk potentially for the rest of your life. So we do that with uh, badge dosimetry. It's not apparent when you come down, we're not glowing. Although I've told my children that it gives me superpowers, they don't buy that either. But that's kind of the physicality of it. Well, thank you both so much. This was great. I think I'm going to struggle to figure out what I'm going to have to sacrifice for the sake of time. I just have one question that I just personally really want to know the answer to, which is I'm terrified of the idea of C. diff or MRSA in space. So are we. So are we. Do you have nasal swabs that are performed? Look for MRSA prior to space flight. Ideally, we don't want to launch anybody with symptoms of C. diff and so, or any diarrheal illness because the chances that it is C. diff is probably rare. The bigger one that I worry about is almost like a norovirus. And that's even worse because you worry about spread amongst the crew. And so we do our best with quarantine, pre-flight and infection control measures to protect everybody as much as possible prior to launch. But we also worry about that. We worry about COVID. We worry about upper respiratory infections. So yeah, our people, when they get up there, I will say that the crew I flew with, I was the only physician and I got up there and one of them asked me about three weeks in the flight, Serena. If we launch with the virus, when we have known it by now. So are we in the clear? I'm like, yes, we're in the clear. Because <laughs> once you get up there, 
you're pretty good. Once you know you have a check. Did you say, why do you ask? I know. <laughs> what are you planning on doing? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, so obviously the neurovirus cruise ship scenario would totally suck in zero gravity. You really depend on your engineering interfaces there, if you know what I mean. But I'll tell you that we had a mild respiratory virus that breached quarantine and made its way up on a visiting shuttle during my long flight. And just the common cold in zero gravity was really amazing. There was no gravity-assisted drainage. You had to find novel ways to slingshot around a handrail to try to get some of that drainage. Your head felt like it wanted to explode. And more importantly, I was the lead spacewalker on the mission, and, and we didn't have to do a contingency spacewalk. But if we had, we couldn't have cleared our ears or handled the pressure change at all. So little things can have a really big impact on a high stakes, high profile, high cost mission up there. So we do our best. And I think we do a pretty good job at managing that risk the best we can. But it requires absolutely constant diligence. And we get reminded of that all the time. All right. Well, here's to keeping unexpected hitchhikers <laughs> firmly within the atmosphere. Awesome. Thanks, Mardula. This is great. Thanks, Mardula. This is a lot of fun. Well, that wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Dr. Serena Anand chancellor and Dr. Mike Barrett for joining us today to discuss aerospace medicine and space flight. We are always looking for ways to improve our podcast and educational materials. So if you have any comments or suggestions, please leave us a review on iTunes or email us at resident360 at nejm.org. We would also like to form a focus group to get more formal feedback. So if you're interested in participating, please email resident360 at nejm.org. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM Education Editor, Dr. Opie Hamnick. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of the NEJM Group.